through today, but I want to take you back to 1996 when I was 16 and a half years old and I just got my P's. So for the young people in the room, you used to be able to get your P's when you were 16 and a half. You didn't have to do any hours or anything like that. They literally pretty much just gave it to you and said all the best. And, uh, and I got mine when I was 16 and a half. And uh, I was here uh, actually at Clovercrest as part of the youth group. And I had a friend who lived in Bridgewater. And he said to me, he's a little bit older than me, he said, oh, why don't you drive up to my place after youth and then we'll spend, you know, Friday night uh, at my place. We'll do some things in the hills on Saturday and it'll be great. You can drive now, no worries. So I said to my parents with all the enthusiasm and foolhardiness, I said, oh, I'm heading up to my mate uh, Ben's house in Bridgewater after youth. I'll be back sometime on Saturday. And they just sort of went, okay, no worries. And I, I really hadn't kind of thought this one through because in 1996, there wasn't a thing called the internet right? Really. Uh, well, not that we used anyway. Uh, there wasn't something called Google Maps. Uh, there was a thing called a street directory. Hands up if you remember using a street directory. UBD, yeah? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. In Melbourne, it's the Melways. Like, actually, you, like, rem- like, young people, try and picture this. You actually had to look for the place, you had to find it on a map, and then you had to follow the map from page to page to actually then work out where you had to go. Incredible thought that the blue dot didn't take you there, right? Like, wow, like that is some crazy thinking. But we had this thing called a street directory. I didn't have one, all right? And I thought, I'll just make my way up through the hills. You can't be that hard, it'll be all right. So after youth group on the Friday night, I drove up to what I thought was going to be the freeway. Didn't quite get there. Got to what I now know is Green Hill Road. I followed Green Hill Road all the way up the hill. It got windy, lots of hills. I was thinking, surely the freeway is somewhere around here. I kept driving up. I went past this thing called Cleveland National Park. I'm like, I have no idea where I am. I'm so lost. Where is the freeway? Where is Bridgewater? And I got to this T-junction just past Cleland National Park. I was super lost. I thought, I've got to be somewhere near Mount Lofty, but I'm not really sure. I knew Mount Lofty, and I knew if I got to Mount Lofty, I'd be able to navigate my way to Bridgewater. I didn't have a lot going for me at this stage of life at all. And I got to this T-junction, and then I turned right, and then I noticed, oh, there's a sign which had some, you know, names on it. Surely it can help me out. So I pulled off to the side of the road, and I thought that I had pulled my handbrake up, and I went back and looked at this sign. I went back and I looked at this sign, and I looked at it, and I went, Mount Lofty, this way. Yep, yeah, great, I can do it. I turned around and looked forward. My car's rolling down the hill. It is literally rolling down, and I run after it. I jump in it, and as I jump in it, I commit the, a cardinal kind of sin of uh, driving, you know, in winter in the hills. I put my foot on the brake and I slid into a ditch. It was a Friday night, about 11, 11.30. It was very dark. I was lost. I didn't have any communication. I'd slid into a ditch. I had no idea what to do next. I wonder if you've found yourself in a time in your life where you've been lost. I wonder if there's been a time in your life that you can recall. You don't have to necessarily, you know, share all about it. You know, you might want to over lunch if you haven't, you know, got that out of your system. But is there a time in your life where you've just been thoroughly lost and you have had no idea where you are, where you're going, or what's going to happen next? In life, we can get lost, but I think also when we think spiritually about our, our uh, life and our following of God and our following of Jesus, or just maybe broader in terms of our purpose for living, are there times where you felt lost? There's, are there, have there been times where you felt like you just don't know what's next, where you're going? What's the roadmap or the help that you need moving forward? Has there been times in your life and your world where you've been in a position where you just haven't known what to do next? I have a friend in Melbourne, and his name's Gabriel. And Gabriel, uh, he, I met him through our church there. And he uh, said to me, uh, well, the first time that we'd met, he said, I feel, I feel lost. And I said, what do you mean, Gabriel? It was one Sunday after church. We're talking. He said, I feel, I feel lost in life. He said, if you looked at my life, my life seems like it's all working out. Um, he emigrated from Eastern Europe and fled um, what wasn't a, a very uh, healthy or free life uh, where he was living, came to Australia, 
and was living in Australia, had a good job, great house, wife and kids. And he said, but I feel lost. There's not a sense of purpose or life in me. And over a process and a relationship of about six months of us talking and getting to know one another and sharing life and faith, he said, I need Jesus in my life. I need hope. I need purpose. I've come to church. I'm learning about this man, Jesus, the one who gives life. And, and I want to choose that. And he put his trust in Jesus. He put his hope in Jesus Christ. And he began a relationship with him. And he said all these things that God had placed into his life actually started to bring purpose and meaning and direction in his life. I wonder if you've experienced a lostness and how your faith has actually shaped you in that. Because as Christians, we believe that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. They're his words. Not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally as well. Essentially, Jesus came to restore what was broken and to make it right again. And God is the God of restoration. God has a heart for the lost. And that is a, a core shaping uh, idea and principle for this series that we're going to be looking at, that God is a God of restoration and he has a heart for the lost. And it might be that you are lost in life. It might be that you're in the room with us, you're joining us online. It might be that there's a lostness in you and you are seeking after Jesus and the one who gives life. Or it might be that you've been following Jesus for some time, but you know that there's areas of your life that aren't restored. There's areas of your life that you are lost, or maybe you're doing the same thing and expecting a different result. But God would actually want to reach into your world in this series and actually um, speak words of life and hope, uh, words that would shape you through his scripture so that what was lost will be found. Maybe what is in the darkness right now will come to light and that you can walk with God in a restored way into the future he has for you. And sometimes God likes to, uh, by his Holy Spirit, illuminate things in our lives and show us things that aren't uh, in alignment with what he has for us. And other times he chips away slowly. And we've been praying uh, as a church and for a church community that this series, as we start this year, would be so pivotal uh, in terms of uh, bringing out uh, lostness, and finding life, bringing out areas where maybe faith has been forgotten and there's some rational decisions that have been made and, and lifting and bringing faith right back up on the boil in your life. Because we believe that God is a God of restoration and he has a heart for the lost. And there's three stories in Luke 15 that really uh, shape this in Jesus' teaching. So if you've got your Bibles, you've got your phones, turn to Luke 15. There's three stories that shape God's heart for restoration and his desire to see lost people found. The first one is uh, around the lost, the lost sheep. There's 99 uh, sheep that are safe. There's one that's lost. The shepherd goes out and he finds the one and he brings uh, it back in and then has a party to celebrate. The first example that Jesus tells is about a lost sheep. Uh, the second example that he gives is around a lost coin. A woman who has 10 coins, uh, she loses one. She loses one of these coins. And, and then she finds it and, and she does the most kind of countercultural thing possible. She has a party to celebrate. She, she celebrates what God has done when she finds this coin. And, and it's like these two first examples, they sort of make sense. You know, you're talking about a sheep, you're talking about a coin, you sort of, you know, Jesus is talking about God's heart for restoration. But then he tells a third story, which is a relational story. A story about a family, and I want to read it out to us today. The lost son, verses 11 through to 24, says this. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate. So he divided up his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine that, uh, that, uh, in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to, feed, to, to his fields to feed pigs. He he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and his sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. What a beautiful story that Jesus tells. And and through this story, he shares about what the kingdom of God looks like and, and what it means to participate and be a follower of God in and through his kingdom. So this story of a man who has two sons, the younger son asked for half the property and his inheritance early. He basically went crazy with all the money. He just, you know, got rid of it all, probably like one of those sort of, you know, people who wins the lotto and then they find themselves on the front page of the newspaper a few years later because it's all gone. You just wonder how did that happen? He, all the inheritance went on wild living. He ended up dreaming of eating pig food. Can you imagine that? And he decided to come home. He came to his senses. He came home to repent to his father. His father saw him coming, he ran to greet him, threw a massive welcome home party for him. And his father was adamant that his lost son has now been found. And in this story, and looking at God being a God of restoration, there's really two thoughts that I want to explore with us today, and one warning. Two thoughts and one warning. Uh, the first thought is that God's generous love is seen in the Father. God's generous love is seen in the Father. This um, parable is known as the parable of the lost son, but it's actually got other titles as well. It's known as the parable of the Father's love or the parable of the waiting father. And the father is incredibly generous to his son, waiting for him and planning to accept him back into the family. You think about the father's love in this story. Firstly, sharing land and inheritance. Giving his son in the first century freedom to choose, which normally wouldn't happen. He showed compassion uh, on his son. This word compassion actually means pity in action. So he, he just doesn't think about it, but he shows compassion onto his son. He reinstates his son. He does this by running to him. He does this by putting a ring on his finger, killing a fattened calf, putting sandals on his feet and having a party. And This is a scandalous story for the first century. If you're in the first century hearing this story from Jesus' lips, it is an absolutely scandalous story. And everyone that would have heard it would have thought the same. A a, a father sharing his inheritance just would not have happened in the first century. A big no-no. It would have brought dishonor to the family. Because if a family in the first century had land, it meant they had means, which also meant they had responsibility. What would have happened was this family and this man would have hired a number of people in their village, in their area, and he would have actually brought to the economy from that perspective. So to sell the land, to give to his son, so his son can then go to another land to spend that money, There's just so many things that are wrong with this situation. It would have brought so much dishonor to the family of the day. And then a father running and restoring his son, again, a big act of dishonor in the first century. If you had money, if you had means, if you had wealth, if you had land, you don't go to people. People come to you. And in the first century, that was how honor was exchanged. So for a father to see his son, to get up, to run towards his son, to get down on his knees and to love on his son who has taken half of what he has away from him, just wouldn't have happened. So countercultural 
for the day and shows the love of the Father. And in many ways, this is a picture, a picture of how God is with us. He loves us. He's patient with us. He lets us choose our own way, but he never gives up on us. And there is always a pathway of restoration to God. Always a pathway. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. It doesn't matter what you think you're hiding away from other people or the things that you're just living large in in public. There is always a pathway of restoration with God. In the micro pieces of our life and the massive big rocks, there's always a pathway of restoration with God. A German theologian, Jürgen Moltmann, he wrote these words around God's love. He says this, he says, the ultimate reason for our hope is not to be found in what we want, wish for, and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and wished for and waited for. What is it that awaits us? Does anything await us at all, or are we all alone? Whenever we base our hope on trust in the divine mystery, we feel deep down in our hearts, there is someone waiting for you, who is hoping for you, who believes in you, We are waited for as the prodigal son in the parable is waited for by the father. We are accepted and received as a mother takes care of her children in her arms and comforts them. God is our last hope because we are God's first love. It's beautiful to know that God is the one who initiates love with us. We can't strive or manufacture or make it happen. Actually, God has created us in a way to be in relationship with him and in a way to be restored to him. It is such a beautiful gift and mystery of our faith, but something to be fully embraced. It is bold and outrageous claim that we are wanted, wished for, and waited for by the God of the universe. But we are. God can be our last hope because we are his first love. See, God's love is a generous love, not one that we deserve. It isn't. It's not one that we deserve, but God's love and his compassion for us sent Jesus to earth and to the cross, and we celebrate the life that we have in Jesus through what he did on the cross, through his life, uh, through his uh, death and his resurrection. He's opened a way for us to have life. And Paul puts it this way in Romans 5. He says, God demonstrates his own, for, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So powerful. And do you know this love in your life? Do you know this love? This generous love of the Father. And how does this love shape your everyday life? living. As we spoke about last week, it can't be a love that just sits up here or a love that we put on the shelf and go, yep, that's great. It's a love that transforms us from the inside out as we accept and embrace this generous love from the Father. So the first thought is around God's generous love that's seen in the Father. The second thought is around, this is a story of restoration, And we see this in the younger son. The youngest son, he took off to another land. He went as far as away from his people that he could. He went to a a, a Gentile land with plenty of um, ungentile, unclean living. He removed himself or he exiled himself to this other place. And then he wasted all of the money away. That village, that community could have really done with a stimulus in its economy and what does this young man do he takes it somewhere else and he deposits it he deposits it into a place that the benefits will never go back to his original community you know probably not the best bloke maybe not the guy that you know you're wishing a happy birthday to you know so he wastes it away he hits rock bottom he dreams of eating pig food Like, that would be the worst. In terms of the strict purity rules that were around the first century, that would have been the lowest of the low to actually go down that path 
Uh, we're, we're in the most unclean thing that he could have done. But he knows deep down, he knows at the end of the day how much his father loves him. And he comes to his senses and he knows that he needs to repent and turn his life around. Verse 18 and 19, I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. You know what I love about the younger son? He doesn't try and tidy it up. I think today in our life and, and how we live and maybe a curated life on social media and different bits and pieces, there's a tendency to sort of kind of tidy it up, you know, and just make it a little more, bit more palatable, a bit more acceptable of some of the things that maybe we've done or we compare ourselves to someone who's done things worse than us. Not that bad. But he doesn't do that, does he? He says, I've done the wrong thing by my dad and by my family and by all the people whom he actually uh, employed and kept going. I need to repent. I need to say I'm sorry. I need to turn from that. And I need to live in a new way. That's the definition of repentance. Turning away from your sin, turning to God and living in a new way. And that's what he does. He just doesn't talk about it or have a conviction and think about it. He actually steps it out. He actually shows courage and he shows bravery. It would have been easier in some ways maybe just to drift, not return. But he doesn't do that. He's actually brave enough to do it. The, and then the son said to his dad, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father's response is one of love, one of grace, one of mercy. And he says, my son who is dead has come to life. He who was lost has been found, verse 24. See, God's heart is for the one. God's heart is for the one. We, we see that in the story of the lost sheep. We see it in the lost coin, and now we see it with the lost son. His heart is for the one. God's heart is for all people to find restoration in his unconditional love. He loves you, he cares for you. There's a pathway to be restored to him. He knows you by name. And he wants you to be in relationship with him. And as I was preparing for today, I really sensed uh, that we needed to hear afresh today uh, the fact that we, there's, no, there's no place too far from receiving the love of God and a pathway of restoration to the Father. It, it doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. What matters is your desire to come back to God and to be restored and your desire to repent and to come into relationship with the living God. And I reckon that's really important for all of us to hear. But there's some today that that's really important. It's really important that you understand that you're not too far away from God's love and restoration. See, repentance is possible for all of us to return to God. And God's Father heart is that we'd all be in relationship with Him today. So I guess a more pointed question for us is, is there anything in your life today that you need to repent from? Is there anything that's going on in your world that you are not aligned with the purposes of God? Is there anything that you know, maybe has crept into your thinking, we spoke about that last week, or into your practice where you're actually just taking steps away from God and you're not stepping towards Him? Maybe you're trying to control yourself, or maybe you think you know better, or maybe the faith elements just dropped off and you're just becoming more rational in how you're processing things, and God is just saying, come back to me. Come back to me. Let me restore you, and let me, let me walk you in my love, in my mercy, and in my grace. But you know, this isn't the end of the story. There's also a warning in this story for us, and particularly for those of us who I think have been in church for some time, and those of us who have been following Jesus for some time. Maybe for some of us, that this is a familiar story, but I think there is a warning in here for all of us, because this isn't the end of the story. The oldest son, because remember the father had two sons, the oldest son hears about something going on, and he comes into the story here in verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the oldest son was in a field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he, had him, he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother came, became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out. So his father goes out to him too. His father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, look. You can just imagine this exchange, can't you? Just the frostiness, maybe not even looking at each other in the eyes, just looking different ways. Look, all these years I've been slaving, slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son... This son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, has come home. You kill the fattened calf for him? He's indignant, isn't he? My son, the father says, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad. We have to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost and now is found. And the warning here for all of us, but particularly for those that have been following Jesus or been in church for some time, the warning for us today is this. Where is your heart? Where is your heart before the Lord? Because sometimes you might know the answer, you might have the words, You might put on the smile, but you know your heart could be far from God. And that's really dangerous. We're in in dangerous territory when that starts to happen. Because what happens here with the the, uh, older son, you know, starts to compare, judge, complain, has this obligation. I've been slaving for years. You haven't given me anything. And that's dangerous territory. Not willing to give grace. The inability to celebrate. They're big ones, aren't they? The Father shows grace, shows love, an ability to celebrate the restoration of the younger son, but the older brother's not having anything to do with it. So there's a spiritual maturity. Sometimes following Jesus isn't just about putting another year on another year. But there's a depth of a spiritual maturity that's cultivated over time where you can give grace, where you can love, where where there's difference or disagreement. You can step towards each other and find a way. You know, what's really interesting here is that the older son wasn't able to do that. He couldn't step into the party. He couldn't do it. And as I've been thinking about this, I've been been wondering uh, around... The fact that the last couple of years and some of the conversations that have emerged, uh, you know, conversations that we never probably ever thought we'd have around health and vaccines and all these different things. And it made me ask the question, how do you put aside differences and step towards one another in unity and love? Because we've managed to do it for a long time. And, and now with the rise of accessibility of information and it feels like people, you know, kind of experts because they Googled a few things or different bits and pieces like that. There is something here that's timeless for us around how do we step towards each other? How do we learn to extend grace? How do we look for unity? How are we prepared to put aside our differences for the bigger goal of being unified? These are challenging thoughts, and I'm not saying I have the answers for it, but I come back to my first question, where's your heart? Because if your heart's right before the Lord, and if you're receiving from God in your life, then you'll much more easily be able to give grace and love and, and, and see the difference, but still be able to step towards the other, even if you have a disagreement. Because one of the most important things in terms of just basic you know, conflict from low to high conflict is the ability to be able to still be in relationship and step towards someone even if you have a disagreement with them. And I, I've seen that in times, but I, in the last couple of years, I must say, I haven't seen it as much. I'm not talking about here necessarily, but just in large. I feel like things have been polarised more than I've seen, but yet we live by a kingdom ethic, and the kingdom ethic would say, show grace and love <laughs> and step towards one another. And that's really important. It's really important that we actually fight for that that's what needs to be fought for (laughs) 
the fact that we would love and we'd show grace and we'd step towards one another. Why? Because God has restored us. Because God's restored us. And because we live in that restoration and that grace that is so undeserved from the Father in our lives, we can pass that on. We can pass that on. And I'm not saying that's easy. It's definitely not easy. But it's the challenge that's before us as we live by a kingdom ethic and we live kingdom lives. Now, I know you've been on the edge of your seat. You're like, what happened, Mike? How did you get out of this when you were 16 and a half and you had no idea about anything in life, let alone how do you drive a car? So I'm in a ditch. It's the middle of the year. It's cold, it's wet. I'm up near Mount Lofty and I'm thinking, well, it's been 16 and a half good years. Here we go. And I was probably pretty worried about what what my dad was going to say when we got home as well. So in this ditch, I prayed and I said, Lord, I need some help right now. I'm in a bit of a pickle. And then I see these two headlights coming towards me from the other way. And I thought, well, I'm either going to get probably killed or helped. I, I didn't really have enough emotional bandwidth to realize there could be an, you know, any other options here. So this car's coming towards me and it stops and, and these two people get out, you know, and this guy goes, oh, you okay? And I was like, oh, not really. I kind of, you know, lost my way here. I'm in this little ditch and I've been trying to get it out. And, he, and I said, oh, I, I can't really get it out. And he took one look at the situation and he said, oh, I think we can just push the car straight through and then you get enough momentum to, uh, to be able to pop out the other side of the ditch. And he goes, but put my wife in the car and, uh, and we'll push it. And I was like, okay, definitely might be losing my car now, but that's okay. And, and we got behind, we pushed this car as hard as we could along, the, along this fence line and then got enough momentum and then popped up over the little hill and we got out of the ditch. And he said, all the best, mate, have a great night. They hopped in their car and off they went. And I was just like, wow, that was some little moment. I thought I was gone. I found my way to Mount Lofty. I got onto the freeway, headed to Bridgewater and went and saw my mate. I did fess up with my parents the next day because, you know, you can't text and all these bits and pieces when you, you know, don't have a phone. Uh, So uh, we didn't do any of that. But the next day I spoke to my mum and dad, told them all about it and they were gracious with me and uh, walked me through the next process of getting the car fixed and all the different bits and pieces. But you know, it was unexpected. It was a great act of kindness that these uh, people would stop and they'd help just a young fella on his way. And in many ways, this is a picture of how God comes into our lives. It's unexpected. It's a great act of kindness. You know, there's nothing that I've done, there's nothing that you've really done that um, can bring the grace and the love of God into our lives. It's by God's invitation, it's His initiative that we would be created by Him and be in relationship with Him. And to think uh, any other thoughts would be foolhardy. But God, through His great act of kindness, brings us into relationship with Him. He restores us because it's a generous act of the Father. And we are restored, we are redeemed so that we can live lives whole and full and share that with others. So important that we start this year in this series knowing that we are a restored people because of the initiative and the act of God Himself. And the bottom line really is that God's love is both an attitude and an action. It's a generous love. He doesn't only think it, but He does something about it. And restoration is always possible with God. And He loves to party. God loves to party. And He parties with the the angels in heaven and with one another and us as we are restored and redeemed unto Him and the plans that He has for our lives. So church, we have an opportunity now to come before the Lord and just say, Lord, how do I need to be restored before you? Is there love and grace I need to receive from you? Is there a forgiveness that I need to give to another? Or is there a repentance I need to give to you? Do I need to ask someone for forgiveness because I have not been showing them grace? And God is just gently or maybe firmly saying to you today, you need to go back to that person because you've been very ungracious. And that's not who I am. And you represent me. So do something about that. 
God's a God of restoration. So just take a moment before the Lord now and let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart and minister to your mind. Ask Him, what is it that He has for you today about restoration and the love of a father? Where is it that the Lord is poking around in your life today? And what's the word that he has for you? It might be a well-received word or it might be one that you want to bat away. But take it because he loves you. Let me read to you Jürgen Moltmann's words again. We are wanted and wished for and waited for. God is waiting for us, is hoping for us, believes in us and calls us to become everything we were created to be. We are waited for as a prodigal son in the parable, is waited for by his father. We are accepted and received as a mother takes her children into her arms and comforts them. God is our last hope because we are God's first love just receive what the Lord has for you today we're going to respond in song we're going to sing about God's goodness and if you'd like one of the team to pray for you please come forward during the song if there's a prayer in your heart to be restored by God then please come forward during the song as we pray as we sing so that we can pray for you